Hello, folks. Welcome to this week's episode of Catholic Recon, Testimonies from Reverts and Converts. This week, I've got Deacon Toby Green on the show. And Deacon Toby, I heard about through Trey Shore, who's going to be, his episode's going to be airing um, pretty soon here. So anyway, Deacon Toby, welcome to the show. Thank you, Eddie. It's uh, nice to meet you, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you so much for agreeing to this. So Deacon Toby is at Queen of the Valley. Lady, Our Lady of the Valley. Our Lady of the Valley. <laughs> so where I'm, uh, where I spent about 10 years in Napa, California, the uh -huh. hospital there was Queen of the Valley. So oh, there you go. <laughs> forgive me. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> truthfully, audience, I don't know much about Deacon Toby, but I actually like that. I prefer going into these not knowing too much so that I can be... Um, surprised. So with that, Deacon, the floor is yours. All right, thanks. Um, so I was um, obviously not raised Catholic. I was raised uh, in a Southern Baptist Protestant uh, environment, um, fairly anti-Catholic. Um, and I, I figured out as I was in my teenage years that I really didn't know what it meant to live a Catholic life. And when I went to college, I came to the College of Idaho here in Caldwell, Idaho. One of the things I wanted to do was figure out what does it mean to be a Christian and how do you live that life? And of course, I tried several uh, Protestant, you know, evangelical, Presbyterian, everything, you know. College of Idaho at the time was a Presbyterian school, so of course that was easy. Um, Pentecostal church was very active on campus, so went there for a while. A couple of evangelical churches really exposed myself to a plethora of um, more evangelical Protestant um, Christianity. And my frustration with them was that they all seem to see scripture and Christianity through a certain lens. And that lens was the only thing that was important. The rest of scripture and the rest of teaching was all subservient to that teaching. And I, it really frustrated me because like, if it's all the word of God, then it's all the word of God and it's all important and it all is uh, important for us to to read and study and understand and at college of idaho we had a new history professor there dr howard Berger, and he i took several classes for him because i was a history major and he ran the history department and i got to befriend him and spent time with him and he suggested he knew i was struggling with this whole christian life thing he said you know you gotta go check out that catholic church downtown and I'm like, well, they're Catholic. <laughs> you know, why would I go there? You know, of course, again, raised that, you know, Catholics aren't even Christians. Why would I go there? But I really respected, you know, Howard Berger. And, and so I went down there and by the grace of God, Father Jerry Funk was the parochial vicar there, like two years out of seminary. And He's a parochial vicar, so he's got a little more time for this college kid with a chip on his shoulder. Sure. So he gave me every Friday afternoon that entire school year. So this would have been my senior year at College of Idaho. So I went down, then of course I had a chip on my shoulder. You guys aren't even Christian, or you don't even know what you're talking about. And of course, all of my objections, he battered away like they're nothing. He answered all of them. At the end of the school year, I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to become a Catholic. So, you know, that next summer, I didn't tell my family anything. I, and I went to RCIA in the fall. <clears throat> and this would have been 83, 84. Okay. Um, just graduated, graduated college, stayed here, got a job, um, went through RCIA. So my family knows nothing about this. I call them on Holy Friday, the day before I become a Catholic, and say, by the way, I'm joining the Catholic Church tomorrow. <laughs> and of course, this is in the 80s, so there's no cell phones, there's no email, it's, you know. So my phone in my, in my apartment went absolutely nuts. They were, 
I finally just said, listen, I'm not leaving Christianity. I'm joining the Catholic Church. And they didn't have any, they had no way to object to that because they don't know enough about the Catholic Church. All they know is what, you know, their Protestant background and ideology has told them, which is, you know, those Catholics don't really, they don't got it. You know, they don't know what they're doing. Um, and so when I tell them, listen, I'm not leaving Christianity, I'm joining the Catholic Church, they had no way to answer that. So I joined the Catholic Church, um, fell in love with that with a Protestant girl. <laughs> so Katie and I get married a year after Catholic wedding in the Catholic Church, Old St. Mary's downtown Caldwell. Oh, cool. Yeah. The first time my parents meet this girl is the day before our wedding. And of course, it's a Catholic wedding. My parents are still pretty vehemently anti-Catholic. Um, and Father Raul Cavarubius uh, was, was the pastor then. And so he married Katie and I. Oh, gosh, I just led you astray. We actually got married. <laughs> Katie and I went to College of Idaho, and her dad was the head of the music department. He got us into Jewett Auditorium with that big, beautiful pipe organ. Oh, wow. So we actually got married on the stage in Jewett Auditorium with this big, beautiful pipe organ, you know, and did all the, all of the music for us was, uh, so the prelude music was a string quartet, which was all Katie's family. And then all of the organ music, of course, was on this big, you know, pipe organ in Jewett. So I don't know if you, how many people know about Jewett Auditorium's pipe organ, but it's one of the biggest, most beautiful pipe organs in the Northwest. Oh, wow. It's absolutely amazing. Um, and of course, Katie and I both had music degrees at College of Idaho. So we spent hours and hours and hours in that building on that stage. So it was a very special thing that her dad worked out with Father Raul to be actually be able to have the the wedding and the reception there at uh, at College of Idaho in Jewett Auditorium. So it was really just a special time for us. But of course, it was all through our, you know, St. Mary's in downtown Caldwell. All the pre prep, all of the pre cane, all that stuff was who Father Raul had at the church. Um, and of course, that's where we went to mass. And, and Katie didn't become a Catholic until God, our kids were working on First Holy Communion. And then Katie's like, the kids are asking a lot of questions. Maybe I ought to become a Catholic. And of course, this would have been, I was joined in 84. She would have joined in early 90s. And I don't know if you guys know what the catechesis was at that time, but it was less than stellar. So we're, we bring this Protestant background to the Catholic Church and really don't still don't really know about the church we don't really know the teaching of the church other than we think it's right yeah you know uh, my wife is very accepting of the fact that she can't receive holy communion until she comes into the church she, we go to mass every week it's you know um and that's just what we do <clears throat> but it really didn't get it you know um i don't know how far you want to go into this oh, geez, just keep going, going. Oh, yeah okay. absolutely so uh, if we fast forward a couple, probably another 10 years, maybe, uh, Father uh, Enrique Terraquiz became our pastor. And about the late 90s, um, the Diocese of Boise reinstituted the diaconate. Okay. And Father uh, Enrique asked me, and so my kids would have been little. Um, my youngest one probably would have been three okay. or four. Um, and I'm still trying to build a career and take care of a family. And, you know, and Father Rule's like, you should become a deacon. And I'm like, <laughs> what? I don't even know. What we don't even know what that program is. You know, oh, it's two years. It's in Boise. You'll be fine. And I'm like, how am I supposed to do that and be a dad? I got young kids and run a family and have a job. And, and nobody even really knew what it was. So I'm like, thanks, Father, but I don't get it. And I just didn't feel the call. Never forgot it. And then, uh, you know, just bumped along trying to take care of our kids and, you know, make sure they're okay and they don't go astray. And when they got into the teen teenage years, that was, you know, I had girls, had all girls. How many? Three. So three girls. 
and that in it in it girls are all in itself uh always an interesting journey <laughs> um so just trying to keep them on the straight and narrow and and you we had a, one of them that we were very concerned was you know, losing her way so she always had a thing about horses so we bit the bullet and went and bought horses and bought a you know property and build an arena and did all that stuff to take care of the kids uh and it and it worked you know it's it saved her um wow. so instead of going down the goth and you know all of that you know it could have been ugly and and we redirected her um and and i wrote i, I didn't well, i wasn't going to stand around and just watch her ride horses so i knew nothing about horses i'm 40 some years old and i buy horses so i learned and when i'm 40 how to ride horses and we keep trying to go to mass and of course you got horses and you're going to mass and you know we were it was really easy to get distracted with life and horses and ranch and cows and taking care of property and and so there was a time there when we kind of so I have a little bit of conversion and reversion all in one story um because we we kind of it, it was easy to get distracted and of course with the protestant mentalities coming into this we didn't have that you got to go to mass every week sure that wasn't just part of the you know as a protestant oh you know you go to church every week and you know if you miss one it's no big deal you know um and again the catechesis wasn't great so that wasn't drilled into us that you, it's a mortal sin to miss mass and we didn't know that nobody told us um so kind of kind of went to where we were going to mass maybe once a quarter not quite Easter's, but close, you know, Christmas and Easter. Um, and then our youngest daughter, when she started high school, said, Dad, I want to start going to Mass. Cool. That's fine. Let's start going to Mass. So we started going to Mass. And what was interesting during this time, so I would have been in my late 40s by then. In my career, I had figured out that... Um, you know, that whole story about get a good education, get a good job, and everything's going to be great. Yeah, that's not really a good story because there's not a lot of fulfillment there. True. So I'm getting to the top of my career. I have a part ownership and a really good business. I'm the vice president of operations. I run a 20 some million dollar company. And I'm absolutely emotionally and spiritually empty. So I walked down this dark night you know thank god i understand now st john of the cross and the whole yeah. dark night yeah. you know and, and how important that is because unless you get to that place of surrender and unfortunately as petulant as we are we're not good at coming on our own to that place of surrender so i had to go through this about four years of total desolation feeling like i was a failure uh, even though in the secular world according to the culture i had this great career and i had this great job and i'm making nice money and and all the trappings i got you know horses and cows and a cool house and property and and i was absolutely miserable so one day i'm praying the rosary and i hear god say i think you should be a deacon and i'm like what <laughs> what are you talking about and what had i kind of jumped ahead here so back up about six months i i was at this place of total emptiness and i just started getting up early i had no idea what to do so i just started getting up early in the morning like five o'clock and reading scripture never really understood the rosary i picked up a rosary and i started praying the rosary so asking for the blessed mother and i still don't really get her other than i know i can't keep doing the same thing i'm doing because i'm empty and something has to change so i'm praying the rosary i'm reading scripture i'm trying to figure out how to pray because pro i mean i love my protestant brothers and sisters but they really don't get how to pray you know the the psalms and you know the breviary are so beautiful and you know, the prayers we have in the Catholic Church, I mean, they touch our hearts, yep. you know? Yep. And when, you, when you're empty, how are you going to pray from your heart? Well, your heart's empty, so how are you going to do that? 
you know, so when you have a prayer that you can go to and you can ask for intercession and you can pray a psalm, you know, and there's a way for you to actually be touched by that and have a conversation with God because your heart is empty. You have nothing to say, you know. So um, I ran into an old friend of mine who was uh, who had become a spiritual director and I I didn't even know what that was. Mm -hmm. But we started meeting informally. And uh, I shared with him eventually this time of prayer where God said, you need to become a deacon. Um, and so we talked a lot about that. And he, he encouraged me to go to my pastor. And it was a little too late that year. So we continued to meet formally and started meeting with his spiritual director formally. Started getting really involved in my parish. I became a sacristan and a lector. And I, I got involved in St. Vincent de Paul, and I became a, a home visitor for St. Vincent de Paul. Uh, and that was a beautiful um, ministry to be involved in. And, and you really see people, you know, often at their worst. I mean, they're just kind of at their wits end, and they don't know what to do, you know. Mm -hmm. And so we, we visit with them and help them the best we can with the resources that we have. Um, sure. So it was really a joy, you know, to meet some of those people and work with them. And, and uh, so the next year, I was preparing to turn in my application to the diaconate. And again, praying the rosary. And the Lord says, you're going to be a deacon, but not this year. Father will ask you to wait a year. I'm like, okay. So, of course, I go in and meet Father. And, and sure enough, he says, I, I'm not sure if you're ready. Let's wait a year. Okay. So, but in the meantime, my spiritual director says, I think you should go to think about going to Curcio. I'm like, okay. I don't know what Curcio is, but he's my spiritual director. I trust him. Let's go to Curcio. So I go to Curcio and at Curcio, it was very obvious to me that God really was calling me the diaconate. Uh, it was a beautiful time. If nobody's... If, if somebody hasn't been to Curcio, I really encourage that time. If you ever feel a call or someone encourage you to go to uh, something you trust spiritually, go to Curcio. I it's a wise thing to do. It's a beautiful men's retreat. There's a women's Curcio and a men's Curcio. And that's a sequestered four-day retreat. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful time to be with good holy men uh, who want to grow in their faith. So it's a, it's a beautiful thought. Um, so I loved it. And that, that year, I continued to grow in prayer, started praying the breviary, uh, which I've grown to absolutely love. If you're, for those of you who don't know what a breviary is, it's what um, all religious and clergy have, to, you know, we're obligated to pray the, you know, the, the breviary. Um, I, as a deacon, I, I'm obligated to do morning prayer and evening prayer. Many religious do all five. There's five prayers a day in the breviary. Um, as a deacon, I, I have to do morning prayer and evening prayer. I also do office of reading. I, I love office of reading. And it starts, of course, praying the Psalms. And then there's an Old Testament reading. And then there's a reflection. And it's usually one of the church fathers, early church fathers. This morning was St. Leo, Leo the Great um earlier this week it was uh, saint augustine there's a, a lot from both of those men um so there's uh, saint athanasius there's uh, polycarp i mean there's beautiful beautiful reflections from uh, the early church fathers so you just learn it's a really good place of learning and prayer um and, and so my morning prayer now is about an hour and 15 minutes or so that's excellent. Uh, wow. Yeah. So it starts at 4 a.m. So I get up at four, grab some coffee, and I sit down with my breviary. So I do, you know, the office of reading. I do morning prayer, and then I do intercessory prayer. So intercessory prayer is a prayer card. Okay. I have just people that I'm concerned about, people that have asked me to pray for them, or uh, so I just have this written on a card, and I. And I pray these intentions every morning. Wow. And then I finish it with a rosary. So that's how my morning prayer goes. And then evening prayer is just, uh, it's evening prayer. So it's um, three Psalms 
and then a small reading and then uh, intercessory, you know, there are some intercessory prayers in the breviary. Got it. And you finish it with that. So, um, so the morning prayer and evening prayer. Um, Scott Hahn books are great, especially for someone who's newer in the faith, because he's pretty basic and the way he explains his, his catechesis is great and his theology is very good, but he has a really good way of explaining it that the average Catholic would understand. Agreed. Agreed. So, yeah, yeah I, I don't have any trouble, you know, um, recommending Scott Hahn books because mm-hmm. uh, they're, they're quite good and easy to read. Um, where, where am I at? Oh, yeah. I was going to say, so you're in the process of becoming. Oh, yes. Yeah. So um, I'm able to enter the diaconate. Yeah. And then it, it was an interesting journey because I ended up with three different priests over those four years in, the, in my deacon formation. So, oh. yeah, <laughs> it was kind of crazy. So half my through my, you know, my second year, as I get toward the end of my second year, my pastor gets reassigned. Okay. So when he's like, okay, you're fine, you know, I'll, I'll do your recommendation letter because you have to have the recommendation of your pastor all four years or you, you don't go through. So if he's not going to support you, then you're done. Uh, you also have to have the support of your wife. So this is a definitely a thing you do as a couple, if you're married, um, your wife has to be on board, you know, um, and it took a while for my wife to kind of get on board and say, yeah, okay, it's. This, I agree. This is something you're called to do. And I'm willing to support you in that. Um, and then, you know, Father, um, Father Rob Irwin, I love Father Rob, and he's now a chaplain at St. Alf. Oh, no. Okay. And he came from a really small town of Rupert to Our Lady of the Valley, which is a huge parish. And we kind of ran him over. You know, he just wasn't, didn't, it seems like he didn't have the skill set from, going from the small parish to a really big parish sure sure and so the bishop in his wisdom said i you know because his desire is to have a a catholic deacon or priest as a chaplain in every hospital so he said your strength is one-on-one let's make you a chaplain let's send you to chaplaincy school and let's make you a chaplain so they so that's what he so they took father rob away because his Charism is much more in that one-on-one, which is a sm- in a small parish is easy to do. In yeah. a big parish, it's r- almost impossible. Yeah. So let's work on your strengths. Let's take you to a different ministry that you know the bishop has a real desire to fill, uh, and let's use your charisms. Um, so Father Rob now is the one of the chaplains at uh, St. Al's main campus in, in downtown Boise, um, and then. We have Father Mike St. Marie, who came, would have been my fourth year, uh, and he's amazing. His Bible scholarship, his understanding of scripture, his catechesis, he's so spot on. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's been a joy to find a man who's in love with the Lord, in love with the church, understands church history. What I, he knows the saint of the day for every day of the year. It's, it's crazy when i told him I, yeah when i told him my ordination day and he said oh that saint's went to saint wenceslas and i'm like how obscure can that be and of course i go look it up and he's right and i'm like okay so how in the world does this guy know september 28th i don't know and i have yet to see him not know who the saint of the day was in the th- almost three years now i've been with him so absolutely amazing, but great Bible scholar understands the Greek. So he's not having trouble going straight to the Greek and going. So the original text says, mm-hmm. <laughs> so one of the things he does for fun is he translates the Greek to English for fun. That's for good. fun. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. And his Spanish is phenomenal because we have, you know, about 65% of our parish is Hispanic. Um so, you know, he has great Spanish skills, his, you know, communication skills with us is fantastic. And he's very supportive of us as deacons. And because he's here by himself, he's really given, you know, some ministries over to us. We're doing the baptisms. We do, um, we preach once a month. We're, we're doing a lot of funerals and rosary vigils and gravesides. And, you know, so we're doing quite a bit 
you know, of that kind of ministry. Wow. Um, and we're, we're doing, yeah. And we're doing a lot of home visits. Um, it's a little harder, you know, through COVID this year. Uh, but now most of us have our, like I have my vaccine. So it's easier for me to go now and, and visit with those, especially the elderly. And we have, you know, a pre- pretty good population of our pop of our parishes elderly. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's nice to be able to take care of them and see them and visit with them, you know, and not to, yeah. to not to be afraid of, of uh, trying to be there with them. Sure. Have that ministry of presence. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. So that's where I'm at. Yeah, that's you are. I'm curious about your wife and your daughters. Um, mm-hmm. I know that that can be difficult. Everyone's on their own right even though they're together there's yeah their own journey so so my daughters were all out of the house by the time i entered uh the diaconate um so it was not a that was not an issue because they were all out of the house our youngest daughter was away to college um our other two daughters were married and away and lived elsewhere Mm -hmm. Uh, um so it was my wife and i just kind of walking through this journey together got it the fun part, of course, is we didn't have the good catechesis, you know, back when we came into the church. Mm-hmm. So as a deacon, it's a deep dive and it's a steep learning curve. And I absolutely loved it. Uh, and my wife learned God. So my wife and I both have much better catechesis now than we did. Understand the teaching of the church better and embrace it, you know. And, and so um, it was a joyful difficult journey yeah you know um so and when it's a, somebody asked me about it, you know what's it like to you know enter the and i'm like if it's a real calling well it's not easy there's a joy there's an inner joy to it and you know that's god's calling because there's a joy there that you can't put it in words you can't put it in writing there's just an inner joy that gives you energy to do the hard stuff because you're filled with God's joy in doing it. Um, so that's what I found was, you know, the work was wonderful. It was hard. And I loved every second of it. So, yeah. Yeah. So that was my deacon journey. I loved it. I still, when I have to do a homily, I always have them written ahead of time. And I still, you know, worry about them. And I change them up to like half hour before yeah. I have to deliver it. I'm still like, oh, what if I move this to you? And so I'm, I've, I've got notes and stuff all over my my homily so that's yeah. great have you had a chance to talk to many protestant converts over the years and be able to share some of your background and, and things like that um not really you know um what's interesting is most of the, my colleagues and stuff I, I i'm an outside sales guy so i really kind of work on my own you know okay. i don't go to an office you know my okay. office is right here in my house this is it so I, I don't spend a lot of time with my colleagues. We call each other and we do this, you know, Zoom yeah. or Teams or whatever. So it's usually business, you know, when we're doing that. When we do get together, um, they all know I'm Catholic. And so they don't really, all they know is that I'm a Catholic and that I'm now a deacon and they don't really understand it. So they just don't go there, which I think is interesting. I think they're a little intimidated by the fact that I'm a clergyman. Got it. So, you, you know, uh, I try to be as approachable as I can. Uh, and even at lunch today, um, the gentleman we took to lunch, I was with one of my other sales rep from, well, my distributor rep. Uh-huh. And, and he and I are very good friends and he knows I'm a deacon. And this uh, buyer um, had no idea. And then as we were getting through lunch, my my friend explains to you know this buyer that I'm a Catholic deacon. And, and it's like the whole demeanor of this guy changed and he, he got really quiet. No kidding. So I, yeah. So I think sometimes being a deacon, they get a little intimidated, you know, because now they understand, oh, this is a guy who's, I mean, he's been ordained. He's a, he's a clergyman and they just don't know how to, inter, how to react to that, you know? And I'm like, I'm just, I'm the same guy I was 10 minutes ago, you know, but they just somehow, somehow see that different. So yeah. a lot of times, um, they aren't they aren't always themselves try to be you know um on their best behavior instead of being just who they are you know so i don't always get the openness and the desire to learn more and kind of that you know, yeah like a sponge trying to learn more yeah it's like when you, you get there it's when you're driving driving fast and you see a cop yeah 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 same kind of thing 
Yeah. Uh, but it's in a conversation or in a relationship. It just kind of changes the tone and the, and the interchange. Yeah. Um, and I think, unfortunately, some of my colleagues don't get it. And so they just don't know. They just don't go there. Got you know? it. Yeah. Um, so it's unfortunate. When I get an opportunity to, I, I'm happy to share and talk about it. Uh, I, so if it, if it comes up, I'm totally open about it. I just wait for it to happen sure. organically, you know, and I, I don't try to force that issue. Well, that's the reason I, I ask is because deacons, I've met a number in the past few months and there's all of them so knowledgeable. Right. I think that they are good um, apologists at the same time and because of their training. Right. And I was just curious if, if that comes up in conversation, because not only do you have the apologist piece and the theology piece, but you have the, the zeal that comes with conversion. Right. Um, not to say that that zeal is not in Cradle Catholics, but on the show we're finding out, um, and through Marcus Grota's show, that there is so much consistent zeal for those that have found the faith. Yeah, and in formation, we saw that too. There were about half of us were converts and half were Cradle Catholics. And, and yeah. we saw that fire... Uh, much more evident, you know, in the converts um, mm -hmm. than in the cradle Catholics. It was pretty interesting. Uh, so that's kind of a, it's a bit of a broad brush that seems to be fairly true. What I do find though, Eddie, is that a lot of parishioners will come because they feel like I'm more approachable than say father. Okay. And so, you know, they'll ask us a lot, of, you'll know, ask me and Deacon Carey, a lot of times they'll ask us about a teaching or they'll ask us about our homily or they'll ask us about a scripture or they'll ask us about, you know, uh, a teaching in the church. And so a lot of it is just a private catechetical teaching to the parish. Uh, and that happens actually quite often. That's excellent. Um, yeah. yeah. I had a family called me last night just had a baby they, their family's all in town they want to try to have the baptism on saturday and i'm like well all of you have to have had the baptism class and all the paperwork has to be in and the paperwork has to be filled out and your baby was just born so you won't have a birth certificate but that's not an impediment mm -hmm. um, but this and this and this has to happen oh well my husband hasn't had the class yet can you teach him this week um <laughs> well this, but this is the calling you know this is what you know my during formation we have to have a, a clergy so either a deacon or a priest has to be your spiritual director during formation so i had the the privilege of being with um father uh ben olenka oh excellent and father ben is love him. I, just, I love him i love him and one of the things he pounded into my head is you're a deacon you're called to service you better have a really, really, really good reason to tell a parishioner no. So when she called me last night, I didn't have any good compelling reason to say no to her to teach her husband the class tonight. So I'm going to meet him tonight and that's I'm going to give him the class. That's great. But, but that's what we're called to do. Our yeah. call as a deacon is to serve the parish. Yeah. That's the calling. Yeah. So you need to have a servant's heart. And if this is what your parishioner needs, it's not a big burden to go spend 20 minutes with your parishioner or 30 minutes. Sure. Why would I not give my yeah. parishioner who has a need a, 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 an understandable need? Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the job. Yeah. yeah. That's what you're called to do. So. Exactly. Um, going back to what you said about your old, old job and the success <laughs> of the world and all these other things. Um, I'm assuming that once you went on this religious journey and and certainly culminating in becoming a deacon that the fulfillment found there did it kind of carry into the your work life in, you know, in a sense? or the joy of the lord kind of carrying you through or how do you, how would you view yeah, that I, you know you know certainly that joy you know makes the job just the job just the job and you and you want to do the job to honor God so that what you learn to do is is do the job in a different way mm -hmm. because now the prayer every day is you Lord let me honor you in my prayer and bless the work that I do um and so that's how I that's part of my prayer in, every morning is that God would allow me to honor him in doing the best job I can do and that he would bless my work and so it's a different way so now I'm working for him 
Mm -hmm. the job is whatever it is. It doesn't matter what it is. Got it. So it's a different mindset. Yeah. Um, And I, I try to encourage my parishioners to have that, you know, because we're, you know, we're serving our Lord Jesus. And, and so when it, when it, when everything that you do is in that vein of serving him, it doesn't matter what it doesn't matter if you're picking up garbage or doing the lawn or um, landscaper or selling pet food or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Because you're doing it to his glory. Exactly. That's what matters. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Because I, I was in your, uh, what you described, I was, that was me for sure. Yeah. And a lot of my identity was coming from that. Sure. And when well, I, that's what the culture teaches, right, Eddie? You got it. You know, we are what we do, exactly. right? Exactly. And, and it's such a lie because it's, we are the, we're children of the most high God. Exactly. But yeah. you can't, I couldn't see that. Everything right. was tied to my job. And when I look right. back at those years, I realized that there were um, a few few gentlemen I can think of that just have this joy about them. Right. And they were not in management, which was very interesting to me. That's not to say <laughs> that there yeah. are managers and, and sure. C level executives that have the joy of the Lord. But those men, when I go back, I actually, it just makes me smile because I realized they could have been doing anything, like you said, and they yeah. would have been filled mm-hmm. with joy. They were the yeah. ones, if someone was complaining, They'd say, you got to look at the bright side. Right. Um, you got to look at the gifts that you have right, right. in front of you. Right. You know, that kind of thing. You know, one of the, one of the cool things about this journey was learning that, you know, before I, I entered the diaconate, I, I still had that cultural mindset of, you know, I am what I do and yada, yada. And I wanted the title and I wanted the money and I wanted that, you know. Um, and when that kind of all got taken away from me which is because I needed that humility to be able to say yes to God, to our Lord Jesus, to enter the diaconate. So it was a beautiful thing, but it was a, that dark night, that journey, that four-year journey into desolation was, it was brutal emotionally and spiritually, but it was what I had to go through in order to be that place of surrender. Uh, and now you can pay me enough to be a manager. I mean, why would I want to take on all that stuff? I have time to go take care of my parish. I can take care of my family. If I want to take a Saturday off, no big deal. Yeah. Okay. Um, but as a manager, you don't have that option. You know, you're putting 70, 80 hours a week in. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have to do that. Well, and with that level of um, commitment or you're just being swallowed up by work, there's no time for prayer. There's there's no time for reflection. Right. A lot of people have right. been mentioning this re, uh, recent recently. If you cannot sit in silence, you might be running from something. And that stuck with me because yeah, we 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 have to be able to sit in that stillness. Yeah, of, of the Lord, you know, and um, that time to sit and reflect is necessary and if we can't sit with scripture and reflect on it or let's say a scott hahn book or you know tim staples or better yet how about you know um pope benedict's jesus of nazareth you know it took me a year to read that i only have one of the four volumes it took me a year to read it because that is so deep you know you'd read three pages and you'd sit down and think about it for a week because you had to it's that it's that deep um and i try to tell my brothers about you know reading that book and and savor it don't try to plow through it it's not a book you do that way it's a book you savor and you reflect and you learn and sometimes i you know i i uh, two years ago for lent i did mother Teresa's i thirst reflection book such a beautiful reflection and they're short they're maybe two minutes okay but it's one that you you sit with it and you reflect on that and you literally spend the rest of the day. If you do it first thing in the morning, part of your prayer, you literally spend the rest of the day reflecting on what she said. And that is the kind of thing we need to do as Catholics is spend that time in reflection of our faith and of our Lord Jesus and what he's done for us. And yeah. we never understand the sacrifice on the cross until we spend time reflecting 
on on the passion yeah um you know this morning of course it's tuesday so it's a sorrowful mysteries and to spend time i mean really reflecting on each of those mysteries and the pain and the sorrow of our lord jesus and spend that time really getting into the depth of that yeah and and that's what we're called to do and i and i told someone one day those mysteries always bring me to the stations of the cross especially you know the fourth mystery jesus you know carrying the cross i always go to that uh stations and i and i have to sit with that for a while before i can go on so yeah um it takes a little longer to do the sorrowful mysteries because i get caught up in that yeah you know, in the stations uh and as a deacon we have father has fridays off so the deacons always lead the stations of the cross and it's such a joyful uh thing to do to spend that time in reflecting and do those stations to pray the stations and in my homily this weekend i talked about take the time in lent to pray the stations of the cross take that time of penitential prayer and reflection and go pray the stations love it yeah I love it. Yeah, when you mentioned the rosary, so this is interesting. My kids are all young, you know, four, yeah. four of them. The oldest is eight, and you know, we try to do the rosary each night. Um, it doesn't always happen, but it's a struggle with with the little with ones. little ones. It's hard. Yeah, it's very hard. And I had made a a quick little YouTube video of me reciting the rosary, and I put it to a slideshow it was for the sorrowful mysteries. And so, the, as the kids are struggling. I just told my wife the other day, I said, you know what, why don't I just mute the video, put the slideshow up. And so for each Hail Mary, there, for the agony in the garden, there are 10 images, 10 oh, paintings. And we finished, it was the best <laughs> rosary we have ever yeah. done. And the kids just said, we loved looking at, you know, at, those, at those images. And that, I don't know, that was just something, uh, the grace of God that right. mentioned it to be able to draw into that because sometimes the, the mind can't picture right. it you get right. distracted and you might need that visual representation to help so yeah and that's where you know um i love getting you know the stations of the cross you think about each station you know so when you're doing that fifth sorrow you know the carrying of the cross to calvary you can literally think about each of those stations as you're doing you know the hail marys yeah and that will get you through and I can't tell you how many times I've been stuck just meditating on one of those. And it takes me a while to get so often when I get to the sorrowful mysteries, it takes a little longer than 20 minutes, you know, yeah. because I get stopped sometimes and I just get into that sorrow, you know, and the depth of his sorrow and the, you know, and um, because that's where the salvation, you know, you know, a lot of my Protestant friends are, I don't get the crucifix. And I'm like, then you never understand salvation because without the crucifix, Without the death of Christ on the cross and him being raised up for us in, in, on the cross yeah. for our sin, we never, there, there's no resurrection. There's no salvation. So the cross, the death on the cross, it's critical to our salvation. Without it, there is none. There's no sacrifice. Here's something fascinating that I remember hearing from a Protestant um, who I love, and uh, you know, he's yeah. a very prominent uh, Protestant pastor. And I remember him talking about the passion of the Christ, you know, the movie. Right. And he said, he came across a few people that said, I can't watch, I just can't look. And he said, you better tape your eyes open. <laughs> yeah. And the passion that came out of him was really something to be commended because right. he just said, if you can't understand and you say it is gruesome, that's the reality of what he did for you. Right. right. And it just, it's, it stuck with me. It really did. And I appreciated that seeing that on the yeah. Protestant side of things. Yeah. 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 You know, so it took me the longest time to wrap my brain around Eddie. We talk about, you know, uh, joining our suffering to Christ on the cross. And until you spend that time reflecting on the suffering of Christ, you never understand there isn't anything we would ever suffer here that he would not be able to journey with us through that suffering, That's even good. at the end of our life. Yeah. Because everything that we would suffer through here, he's been there, done that. Exactly. 
and his all hand is always out in invitation. Every day we have an invitation to join him, to come into his love, or not to. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, we can either choose to be the petulant child, or we can choose to surrender in love, and accept the invitation of his salvation. Very. And it's an everyday journey. You yeah. Know? Yeah. 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 So uh, I'll end with one more question. Going sure. back again, like. Sure. Put yourself in the shoes of the VP that you were and uh -huh. doing all these things and, and um, acquiring whatever. I don't know the, you know, the horses and you said you had all these sure. things, right? Um, what would you tell? How old were you at that time? Let's say, let's, let's start there. So uh, I was in my mid forties. What would you tell the gentleman in his mid forties? What would you say to him? Don't, don't follow the lie of the culture. Follow the life and light of Christ. That's where you'll find fulfillment because the culture's, the culture's message to you is a lie and it's empty and it's from the enemy. Jesus' quest for your heart is the truth. And only in there will you find fulfillment. You'll never get it in your job. You'll never get it in a title and you'll never get it in your paycheck. Fulfillment will only come in your faith in Jesus Christ. Love it. Love it. Thank you so much. That was Thank a, you. I, yeah. I appreciate it. Pleasure yeah, to meet you. My pleasure. Um, did you give your testimony at the men's conference? I did. Okay. I did. Wonderful. So Were I was there? like, I was there. Oh, yes. wow. Yeah. 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 As we got talking, I'm like, Oh yeah, he's the one from California. The, his testimony at the men's conference. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's the that's the guy. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, uh, wonderful. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, everyone that watched the video, make sure you subscribe to this channel. Uh, send people to my website eddytrask.com uh, to fill out the form to be a guest on this show. And also, as a reminder, new episodes air every Tuesday at three o'clock Mountain Standard Time. Until next time, take care and God bless. Bye.